Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about recent work that I've done with uh, my PhD student, Andy Lipnicki, at uh, RIT. We have been trying to see if the vast polar structure of dwarf galaxies is a serious problem for Lambda CDM. Most of the results, uh, the new results that I'll be showing you are from a paper that we just submitted, so I welcome your comments and feedback. This is still work that's in progress in some sense. So the way this problem has been posed by uh, some groups is that if you were to look at the distribution of dwarf galaxies and the classical Milky Way satellites are shown here in yellow, okay, and uh, the other symbols denote the newer satellites as of 2012. This is a figure from Pawlowski's paper. They appear to uh, be in a roughly planar structure. Okay, so the Milky Way disk is about here. This is the best fit plane that goes through the uh, satellites, and this plane is fairly thin, right? And this appears to be inconsistent with the generic expectations of isotropic structures that you see in Lambda CDM simulations. More recently, uh, various authors have found similar planar distributions around uh, Andromeda, which raises the question how frequent these type of structures are. And this uh, observation really goes back to Linden Bell and Kunkel and Demers in the 70s. And this was such a beautiful introduction in his paper that I have an excerpt here. And so he starts by saying, some bad weather during an otherwise successful photometric run gave me time to ponder the Magellanic Stream and to wonder whether, like the Magellanic Clouds, other neighbors of our galaxy were associated with streams in neutral hydrogen. We should all start our papers this way. Um, and, and this is, you know, the first time that he plots the distribution of the Milky Way satellites, and he, he sees that they're in a uh, apparent plane. Now, Krupa and others have argued that this planar structure, okay, again, here is the Milky Way disk, this planar uh, distribution uh, this is now just the classical Milky Way satellites, is inconsistent with being drawn from a parent population of, uh, of, uh, from cosmological simulations. Now, the basic assumption that he makes there is that the spatial distribution of satellites is the same as the spatial distribution of mass in the dark matter halo uh, itself. Now, various authors... Uh, including Libetskind, have pointed out that the main assumption here is, is flawed. Okay? So Libetskind notes that the satellites of systems like the local group, in fact, do not trace the distribution of halo mass. Okay? So what he's showing here are uh, projections along the principal axes of various uh, and body simulations. And he finds that the distribution of satellites is actually aligned with the major axis of the triaxial halo mass distribution. Now, another type of solution to this problem has been put forward by Shia and Tully, who showed that these planar structures are, in fact, uh, consistent with large-scale structure, possibly due to the evacuation of the local void. And here's a nice figure from McCall's 2014 paper. He's not specifically talking here about the vast polar structure of dwarf galaxies, but it's, it is related. So if, if you look at all the, uh, the brightest galaxies within about 6 megaparsec uh, of the Milky Way, that's shown here in a, in a top view projection, okay, and in a side view projection, you can see that they line up in a planar structure. So possibly, you know, various groups have argued that the uh, planar distributions that you see on small scales are imprinted from large-scale structure. And a final class of solutions is to invoke 
uh, baryonic physics. Okay, this has been done by Sawala et al. in 2014. They used hydrodynamical cosmological simulations to argue that, in fact, the kind of structures you see around the Milky Way and Andromeda are not inconsistent with these kind of uh, simulations. Now, these uh, solutions have been challenged by uh, groups, uh, by various authors, including Pawlowski. Okay, Pawlowski, for example, notes that uh, Sawala's solution here doesn't adequately take into account the radial distribution of the satellites. So what we've done recently is to take a different approach to this problem. It's a very simple approach, and we're asking two very simple questions. Okay, the first question is, which satellites drive the fit to this apparent planar structure? Okay, now, prior to um, our work, a uh, number of groups, including Pawlowski and Krupa and others, uh, in fact, argued that LEO-1, for example, which has very extreme kinematic properties, is not a member of the vast polar structure. Okay, so we, re we re-examine uh, this question here in the broader context. Okay, and the second uh, question that we ask is, is the vast polar structure a dynamically coherent structure? Okay, in other words, now we have the HST proper motions for the satellites, so we can take the 3D uh, positions and velocities and integrate backwards in time to see whether or not the structure disperses within a, dynamically, uh, within a dynamical time. All right, so in order for this to be a serious problem for Lambda CDM, the structure should be dynamically coherent. All right, so what Andy has done here is he's used uh, an orbit integration code that I wrote a few years ago and uh, integrated the orbits of the classical Milky Way satellites uh, backwards in time, so I'll talk about that later. This figure is uh, from our paper is showing uh, the classical Milky Way satellites in blue. Uh, the ultrafanes are shown in red. The DES satellites are shown in, I guess, light blue here. Uh, this is the confirmed and unconfirmed spectroscopically, confirmed spectroscopically satellites, uh, as well as uh, a satellite for which we have dynamically predicted satellite for which we have some initial spectroscopic evidence. And again, you can see that the uh, best fit plane here that's shown in the solid line, okay, this is a, a roughly planar structure, and this is the, the dotted lines here show the RMS thickness of the plane. This is a pretty thin plane. So let's start with the first question. Okay. So on the left here is shown uh, the fit that includes all the classical uh, Milky Way satellites. And LEO1 and LEO2 are shown in uh, open red circles. Here the fit has been done to all 11 classical satellites. Right. If you remove LEO1 and LEO2, all right, you see that the thickness of this planar structure increases. All right. That's visually already quite apparent that LEO1 and LEO2 significantly drive the fit to the planar structure. Now, what's shown here is the probability density that a random sample of 11 satellites will have a given thickness. Okay, here uh, Andy has uh, normalized uh, the thickness to the median radial distance. Okay, so this is the uh, RMS thickness of the plane, but he's normalized it to the median radial distance. This is fairly typical uh, to do in the literature these days. This is because, you know, if you have a compact uh, distribution of satellites, okay, that will have a, a smaller uh, RMS distance. Okay, so uh, one normalizes by the radial, the median radial distance to account for this. So uh, what we're doing here is comparing to the Elvis uh, simulations uh, as well as the Electea. Now here is the Milky Way. Okay. 
plane for all 11 satellites. And here is Milky Way without LEO1 and LEO2. Okay, so you can see that if you do not include LEO1 and LEO2 in, in your uh, best fit plane, okay, then the cosmological simulations are consistent uh, with the Milky Way's distribution of dwarf galaxies. In other words, if you exclude LEO1 and LEO2 from the vast polar structure, okay, it becomes consistent with dissipationless cosmological simulations like Elvis and uh, Via Lactea. So thinner distributions here are going to be uh, towards the left. So um, many of you know that uh, LEO1 and LEO2 have uh, fairly uh, extreme kinematic properties. So uh, Tony Son uh, obtained uh, uh, the HCD proper motions for LEO1. Mike Boylan Kulchin has also studied it. And uh, you, know, you can see here that if you look at the velocities uh, of these satellites as a function of distance here, both LEO1 and LEO2 are moving uh, pretty fast uh, compared to uh, the escape velocity. Okay? Given the errors, LEO2, in fact, could be moving even faster than the uh, escape speed. Right, so you can, given the HST proper motions, okay, the 3D positions and uh, velocities, all right, which will give you the initial conditions at, at present day, okay, you can integrate the orbits uh, backward in time. This is now shown for LEO2. Okay, and you see that for the mean of the HST proper motions, uh, that LEO2 has spent most of its time in the last uh, couple of giga years at large uh, galactocentric distances. Okay, and this is also the case if you were to use uh, the one sigma uh, range as well as the uh, three sigma range uh, of the proper motions, all right? Uh, if you sample the velocities, you'll see that about 80% of the time it has a velocity that's greater than uh, the escape velocity. So very likely LEO2 is uh, on its first uh, infall. Okay, so the properties that are shared by LEO1 that others have argued uh, should exclude it from the vast polar structure analysis are likely shared by LEO2. So I'm showing here a similar kind of plot. Okay, so Andy has uh, here shown on the top panel. He's taken the, uh, uh, the initial conditions from the HST proper motions and integrated uh, backwards in time. All right, and again, this is, this is done in a static, and assume static potential uh, for the Milky Way. And what you see here, uh, again, Leo two, one and two are shown in, in red, the others are shown in green. Uh, what you see here is that as you go backwards in time to minus 0.5 giga years, minus 1 giga years, the planar structure disperses very quickly. Okay? Here it's fairly thin. As you go back to a giga year, it's, uh, you know, it's not really, it's no longer a thin plane. And the same thing happens when you exclude uh, LEO 1 and 2 and you integrate. So this movie uh, shows uh, the orbits as a function of time. And you see that the structure is clearly not uh, dynamically coherent. Okay. Now, a question that we have to ask in this context is, are the HST proper motions reliable? Okay, and the reason we have to ask this question is because, well, you have the <laughs> measurement and you have also, in some cases, fairly large errors. Okay, so, and this is relevant for the second part of our analysis in terms of looking at whether or not the uh, structure is dynamically coherent. Okay, so we've come up with a particular way of uh, trying to answer this question. Uh, there may be others, but let me tell you what, what we've done. 
Now, the errors are dominated by the errors on the velocities, okay? The position errors are, uh, uh, are significantly smaller than the velocity errors, okay? So we're going to take an average position error, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you two different cases where I have a, a, a high velocity error and a low velocity error. And what we're doing here is we are distributing particles in a ring, okay? And we're trying to see for what level of error does this structure continue to look like a ring, okay? So this is a high error case, okay, 50% relative to velocity. They were initially distributed in a ring. And you see that well before Gaia year, particles, these are 11 particles that were distributed in a ring, and well before uh, a giga year, the structure no longer resembles a ring. Okay, so 50% error is too high, clearly. Now this is a low error case, and you'll see that, yes, the structure will disperse a little bit, but more or less up to a giga year, it roughly uh, resembles a ring. Okay, so using motivated by uh, this analysis, we have identified the dwarfs that you can trust and the ones that you cannot. All right, so here are the, the dwarf galaxies whose proper motions are reliable, that, that is shown here in, in bold, okay, Sag, LMC, SMC, Sculptor, Draco, Ornax, and Leo 1. So these seven out of the 11 classical satellites have uh, errors that are low enough that you can trust their orbit integrations. Okay? And for these seven also, Okay, if you look to see if the structure disperses, uh, you'll see that for these seven for which you can trust the orbit integrations, the uh, planar structure also disperses in less than a dynamical time, okay, indicating pretty clearly that the structure is not dynamically coherent. Let me mention two uh, related problems. There is a very significant observation bias at uh, low latitudes, all right? This is a figure from McConaughey's 2012 paper. Okay, the number of known uh, uh, satellites is a function of galactic latitude, and you see that at latitudes less than 30 degrees, we know of only one, okay? We expect uh, of order 10, okay? So I would really urge those of you who are involved with WFIRST uh, to try and study uh, galactic structure in more depth uh, at low latitudes. The second problem, and this has been highlighted by uh, a number of people, including Andre, is that the Milky Way's dwarf uh, population is much more, shown here in the red, is much more centrally concentrated than uh, cosmological simulations. Let me go ahead and summarize. So we've shown that if LEO1 and LEO2, both of which have extreme kinematic properties, are excluded from the vast polar structure analysis, the distribution of Milky Way satellites matches cosmological simulations. We find that the vast polar structure of dwarf galaxies is not uh, dynamically coherent. It disperses in less than a dynamical time when you include uh, all the 11 classical Milky Way satellites. And that is also the case for the seven classical satellites for which you can definitely trust the HST proper motions. Those also display a lack of coherence uh, in their orbits. So I, uh, in um, closing, I just want to emphasize that what we really need now okay, are more accurate proper motions for these four satellites, Carina, Leo 2, Sextons and Ursa Minor. Given that LEO2 significantly influences the fit to the planar structure, that should be uh, the uh, highest priority. Thanks a lot for your attention.
we have a couple minutes for questions, but I'm going to abuse my privilege and start. Please abuse. Um, so you didn't mention what potential you used for the Milky Way, and I'm assuming that the that the shape of the potential matters a lot. It was right. still, whether yeah. one assumes so the dark we, matter halo is flattened yeah. or whether it's triaxial at all at the large radii the satellites live at, et cetera. So what, what yeah. have you thought about? So in that? this initial work, I mean, that's something that we, we plan to do in the future, but in this initial work, we used a spherical uh, NFW Hornquist potential with um, real masses that are comparable to what you find in the okay. Elvis situation. Do you have a back of the envelope estimate for what that might do to the orbit integrations if you choose a different the potential? Tri if you look at uh, triaxial halos. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would I would still um, expect that in terms of the dispersal, I would still expect that the structure is not uh, going to be dynamically coherent. But the shape, I doubt, would affect that. Okay. I was going to ask a very similar question um, because I don't know necessarily if the relevant quantity is the error in the velocities, but the error in the velocity relative to the acceleration. And so that makes me worry that a different potential amplitude yeah. could also mess things up. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. And it's not something that we've yet looked into in detail. Well, uh, and then. From a, from a statistical standpoint, what does this dynamical argument really tell you? Because presumably, you know, if, if things only go to a transient period where they happen to have a plane, that's sort of already included in these counting arguments that people make. So, so what does this really tell you doing this exercise? So, you know, it, it, some of these groups have argued that... Um, not only the positions, when you look at the planar structure, you're sort of, in, in a sense, you're just talking about the positions. But they've also argued that they have uh, uh, similar angular momenta, okay? which implies then, okay, if you start talking about angular momenta, you've, you, know, you are then in the realm of dynamics. And then it's a natural question to ask, is the thing dynamically coherent? Does it have its own angular momentum? Can it support itself okay, from uh, dispersal? And what we've shown is, is, you know, is that it cannot. So it's not about statistics, it's sort of more just a, a, a any kind of question. With the, it's, it's really addressing the question, you know, is it a dynamically stable structure? Does it have its uh, own angular momentum that can support it from collapse? Sorry? So you happen to observe that way now? Well, you observe an apparent planar structure. Okay, so that's why we asked, you know, two different questions. I mean, one question we asked is, do you really observe a, a planar structure that is inconsistent with cosmological simulations, right? And the second question that we asked is, is this structure uh, dynamically coherent? Okay, is it actually, you know, what is the cause? It, it, can we sort of ascribe a root cause, a dynamical cause? to the structure. So that's one way of answering uh, your question, for example. Okay, and it appears, um, and with the caveat, of course, of that we haven't varied uh, halo shapes and so forth, that we, you, know, you cannot. So the last question's for James Bullock, and then we're gonna head into the discussion section anyway. So how you guys wanna deal with it, you can deal with it. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, really quickly, I think, um, first a comment that I think the most sort of interesting slash compelling reason why this VPOS is interesting is that it, it ha a lot of these dwarfs appear to have the same pole. They, their orbits are pointing sort of in the same direction. And I think that's why integrating these things backwards in time is, is important because that common pole for the orbits is very suggestive that there's some kind of coherent formation scenario. Um, just as just sort of a, a second comment, I guess. And one thing you could do to sort of convince people that you're the shape of your potential is robust enough to predict orbits is you could just run it on some subhalos in Elvis and demonstrate that you can you can more or less say where where they were in the past and if you could do that you know right yeah that, that's I, I agree that's a very important question it's not one that we've looked into yet in the future but it's uh, one of my other students is almost certainly going to be working on this cool uh, well, it just remains to, to thank Sukiana again. Thank you. Oh, thank you.